Even though we began our series in Mark last week, I want us to look at a different passage this week to consider something about the gospel. Because I think it's very important we understand it's in Romans 3. If you turn there with me to Romans 3, we're going to read this passage. We're going to consider this aspect of the gospel that is, is truly weighty. And there's no way that I can give it full justice in the period of time that is allotted this morning, but I will try to overview this concept that the gospel presents. In Romans 3, we're going to begin in verse 21. Romans 3, 21. It says these words, Paul writes, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, He passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time, so that He would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith. Jesus, And that's what we'll be focusing on there is verse 26. How can God be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus? But before we look at that, let us pray that God would illumine our hearts and our minds to understand His Word. Let's pray. Father, as we look at Your Word, encourage and sanctify us. And if anyone has yet to experience being saved by your grace, may you bring them into a saving relationship with yourself through your Son. And Father, be glorified. Be glorified through the preaching of your Word and through your name being praised through the preaching of your Word. Oh, how we glorify you, God, that you are both holy and gracious, wrathful and loving. At the same time in the Gospel, we see all your attributes come and meet and beautifully put on display for us to behold and see. So when we look at the gospel, we see your beauty and your glory shown, O oh God. Truly, the cry of our hearts then can be, to you be the glory. Indeed, to you be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. something that is weighty and something that is deep. And it is the great dilemma resolved in the gospel. There is a dilemma that is put forth in Scripture. There are many dilemmas that are put forth in the Bible. Many problems. Many issues and many solutions. In the Old Testament we see Israel as a nation had so many problems. Issues with the Philistines. Idol worship. Wicked kings. So God raised up prophets as a solution to their problems. He raised up kings to shepherd them. Yet still other problems arose and God graciously dealt with the Israelites and resolved those problems. But see, my dear brethren, there is a great issue and a great dilemma that is put forth in the Bible. There is a great so a seeming contradiction. There is a weighty paradox that is put forth before our eyes, both in the Old and New Testaments. It is something that is spoken of often in the Psalms, even in the ministry of Jesus. And it is this dilemma. How can God be a holy God and forgive the sinner? How can God be a just judge 
and yet let the convicted felon who stands before his tribunal off the hook, free to walk out of the eternal courtroom. How can it be that God can be this way? How can it be that God can be both loving and holy? The answer is found in the gospel. To get a picture of this dilemma, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Exodus. In Exodus 34, which contains one of the most incredible narratives in all the Old Testament. And it is where, this is after God has given the Ten Commandments to the Israelites. And in the previous chapter, in Exodus 33, Moses cries out to the Lord. In verse 18, he says, I pray you, show me your glory. Again, this is after Moses has already witnessed the great cloud upon the mountain there at Mount Sinai, and the thunder and the lightning and the terror that gripped the Israelites. Moses had also seen the Lord appear to him in the burning bush. He knew that God is a holy God. And yet he cries out from the depth of his soul, I pray you, Show me your glory. And what does God reply? What is the divine response? Verse 19 makes it clear. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of Yahweh before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But then verse 20, listen to what God follows up by saying. He says, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. This speaks to the holiness of God. But nonetheless, God says, verse 21, there is a place by me and you shall stand there on the rock and it will come about while my glory is passing by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will take my hand away and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. This is where <coughs> the song Rock of Ages comes from. Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Christ is the rock of ages which we hide in so we might see God. But nonetheless, Moses had been hidden in this rock and only see the back of God as he walked by. God is holy and the most holy of men and most righteous among us cannot stand in his presence. But as I said, chapter 34 contains this great dilemma. We'll begin in verse 5. Listen to what it says. The Lord descended in a cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of Yahweh. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. So here's what God says. I am gracious and I'm compassionate. It says in verse 7, who keeps love and kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. My only question when I read this passage is how can that be? How can God be loving and kind? Yet it says there, He's not going to leave the guilty unpunished. Therefore, it would seem that's a contradiction. 
right there in those verses, side by side. This is the mystery of the gospel. This is the mystery which was hidden in ages past, but has been revealed to us through Christ. It was something that was hinted and put forth in the Old Testament, but it, it was a veiled truth. Nonetheless, it was there, but in, a, in an infant stage. The truth of the gospel has always been there, all the way back in Genesis 3. Yet it was clouded and hidden, and not fully revealed, not fully realized, not fully displayed. But Christ comes on the scene and resolves this dilemma. Turn with me to Proverbs. Proverbs 15. I'm sorry, excuse me, Proverbs 17, 15. Listen to this. What did Romans 3 just tell us? God is the one who justifies the wicked. And in, this, in, the, in one chapter later, Romans 4, 5, it says, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. It says there in that verse, you, in order to be saved, must believe that God justifies the wicked. Listen to verse 15 of Proverbs 17. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous, both of them are an abomination to the Lord. It's a contradiction, it seems. It seems as if Scripture says God hates when the wicked are justified. Yet, it says he is abundant in kindness and he loves and he forgives. The Psalms, as I mentioned, are filled with praises lifted up to God for forgiving the soul of the sinner, redeeming the psalmist from the depths of Sheol. How can God be still holy, still just, yet gracious and forgiving. And that is where the gospel that is presented there in Romans 3 comes in. And that is what we're going to contemplate and consider in this time that we have this morning. Just to briefly summarize where Paul has come from and where he's going here in Romans he has begun in chapter 1 to describe the sinful nature of man. I'm actually right now in the open air as I stay on the streets week in and week out at the clinic in downtown Greenville at the rest area. I've been preaching through Romans 1 in the open air verse by verse. And uh, in fact, last Friday I preached on Romans 1, 26 and 27, which is about homosexuality which was a very touchy issue to preach on in the open air, but it, it went very well. And then actually that same night I got to preach on verse 28, 28, the beginning of verse 28. So I've been going through that. It's been fresh on my mind. Paul has presented in Romans 1 that man is sinful to the uttermost and totally depraved. Chapter 2, he talks about the, righteous, the, the supposed religious people are also totally depraved and outside of Christ and dead in sin, and they need to be saved. And he brings it, brings it all together and puts everyone in the same camp in Romans 3, verse 9. Look at what he says. What then, are we better than they? In other words, we Jews, he's speaking of. Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. We have to talk about this morning, that very thing. In our study of... Speaking of when the LBC speaks about how a, a natural man cannot understand Scripture. And those things are spiritually ascertained. Here's why. The Scripture says there's none who understands. No one can understand spiritual things. It says there's none who seeks for God. That's a common misconception among Christians. They say people are seeking for something. They say they're just seeking for God. They're just, they just need Him to be revealed to them. They're not seeking for God. They're seeking for sin. They're seeking themselves. And God has to seek them out. It's not the other way around. People aren't seeking after God and God shows Himself. People are seeking after sin and God shows Himself to them. It says there's none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There's not even one that will do an ounce of goodness. 
Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asp is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So he has left us without any hope. He has just wiped the floor clean. Everybody's on the same level plane. We are dead in sin. We don't seek for God. We hate God. We don't do anything good. Our mouths are even an open grave. And they're full of cursing and bitterness. Or wicked, wicked, wicked. Without hope. And then he, in verse 21, all the way down to verse 31, those ten verses at the end of the chapter, presents the good news of the gospel. Chapter 4, he says, he, he holds up Abraham as an example. We've looked at that before. And then chapter 5 and so on, he brings forth what are the implications of being saved. But in Romans 3 is one of the most incredible passages in all the Bible. Because it answers the question of the ages. The dilemma that is put forth in Scripture. So let us look at that as the dilemma is answered in the Gospel. Verse 21, it says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. What's he talking about there? He's talking about God gives righteousness to sinners. A free gift of righteousness. And then it says, it's witnessed by the law and the prophets. And that's what we just, we just read out of um, Exodus. We read out of um, Proverbs. God forgives and God saves. We saw that in Exodus. God is loving and kind. God redeems the sinner. So it was witnessed by the law and the prophets. It was written about in the Old Testament. Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. That's the glory of the gospel. We believe we're saved. For there's no distinction for all sin and all surely the glory of God. Being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption of which is in Christ Jesus. That word justify is something we need to be sure we understand. What does the word justify mean? Justify, justify, justifying, justification. In fact, theologians, we use that term when we talk about theology. If I'm discussing theology with a friend of mine or writing about it, I'll say justification. And that's a big term. What does it mean? It simply means to make just, to make right, to declare right. And that's a careful distinction I want to make. It's declare righteous. That's what justify means. To declare righteous. Not necessarily to make righteous. Not that you make, you actually make someone a holy person. Because we're all unholy. We all have sin. But it's to declare someone as if they are righteous. It is to regard and to treat Someone as if they are just. When someone is in court and they're cleared of their charges, we say that they are justified. They have been justified by the judge. They have been cleared. Even let's say someone goes to court and they are forgiven for a crime they actually did commit. And they were actually condemned, but someone paid the bail, someone paid the fine, and so they're justified. They're let go. They're treated as if they kept the law. Um, I'll give you an example of how this is shown. Is the reformer Martin Luther, when he was studying this word, he was studying the Latin word of justify, which is where we get the word justify. It's used to picare. Kind of weird, trend, uh, weird pronunciation. Used to car, but it means to make righteous. And see, in the Roman Catholic system of salvation, that's what you had to do to be saved. You had to make yourself righteous. You had to do the sacraments. You had to do the mass. You had to keep 
the command to be righteous. You get to be made righteous inherently. But as the Martin Luther, as he studied here, specifically in the book of Romans, in Romans 1, Romans chapter 1, the same word is used here. And he looked at it in the original Greek. And the original Greek is a different word than what is used in the Latin Vulgate translation. Which is not, it doesn't translate this word very well. The original Greek does not mean to make righteous, but to regard as righteous. That is a very clear distinction we need to make. It is to declare righteous, to treat as righteous. And that is the real sense of the word, to justify in the biblical sense, is to treat the sinner as if they had not sinned. It is to treat the ungodly as if they are godly. It is to treat the unrighteous as if they are righteous. To treat the filthy as if they are clean. That is the biblical sense of the word justify. To be regarded as righteous. How can God do this? What would we think if we went home this afternoon and we picked up a newspaper? Or perhaps read on the internet. About someone here in South Carolina. who had committed murder, who had committed rape. And they stood before a tribunal here in South Carolina, and they were cleared of their charges, and nothing was required of them. They just let off the hook. Just, the judge just said, yeah, you can go. We, we ourselves would be disgusted. We'd be, we'd, we think it's filthy to do such a thing. There'd be no protesting in, in, uh, in Colombia. For sure. And wherever that courthouse would be located. People would be irate. People would be in an uproar that a judge would let someone who was so evil and so filthy off the hook and let them go. And yet here is the issue. So many people just think God is like that. They think God can just arbitrarily sweep sin under the rug. Just forgive. It's okay. It's okay. Not okay. It is not okay. Our sin is not okay. And it's even not okay just for God to forgive us. To do so is to compromise His holiness. God is not ever going to compromise His character. That's the dilemma of the gospel. Because Scripture clearly says He forgives. He forgives, He forgives, He forgives. He redeems the unrighteous. And then it says He hates those who regard the wicked. And he's holy. And he's just. And so, the solution is found in verse 25. Look at what he says. He says, whom God, that's, he's talking about Jesus here. He's the object in question here. He says, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. We stop right there. What is this word? Brethren, this is the most in relation, I would say outside of the names of Jesus Christ and the names of God, this is the most important word in all, in all of the Bible to understand. The most important, because this is the heart of the gospel. Outside of the names of God and the name of Jesus Christ this is the most important word, I would say, to understand. And every Christian needs to know it. Every Christian needs to know the definition of this word backwards and forwards, inside and out. We actually use this word not too common anymore in English. Not very rarely do we use it, but propitious. It's another form of the word. It means favorable, kind. Someone who's nice. So we say they're propitious toward other people. It's very rare we people, uh, people in English-speaking countries use it anymore. But the form of the word here, propitiation, means something a little different. In the original Greek, the word that's used here speaks to an absorption of wrath. And that's what exactly what propitiation means. The word propitiation means wrath has been absorbed. 
Wrath has been satisfied, you could say. Wrath has been taken away. And this really references back to the Old Testament. The various sacrifices that God instituted, where there was a lamb or, or another animal that was sacrificed, and it symbolically bore the sin of the person who was in question and who had sinned, and it was instead killed. That's a beautiful display of what propitiation is. Another great display is in, uh, is in Leviticus 9, when God first institutes the sacrificial system, and, and Aaron presents the sacrifice on the altar, and it says, hey, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice on the altar. That is the essence of propitiation, that God's wrath is unleashed upon someone, and they absorb it, and they take it upon themselves. Scripture oftentimes points to God's wrath being as a cup, something that is contained within a, within a specific space. And it's just imagery. It's to give us an idea of what God's wrath is like. It's like a cup. It's described that way in the Old Testament. Even in the New Testament, Jesus' prayer in the garden, He says, let this cup pass from me. It was a cup of God's wrath. And I, I, I've described to my siblings this way. It's helpful to understand it in this manner. Christ, uh, you, can see, you can see it like this. The word propitiation, to kind of illustrate it, is uh, God's wrath, you can imagine, is like a cup of water, and you take a sponge or a cloth, and you just dip it in this cup, and it absorbs the water, and you pull it out, and there's not a drop left. Not a drop left. That is what propitiation is. It is a, it is a, set, it is a, a sucking up of God's wrath. It's a, it's, a, it's a total absorption of His holy indignation. Every Christian needs to know that. That is so glorious. That is so wonderful. That is so, so absolutely amazing. That's the heart of it, my friends. It's the heart of it, brothers and sisters. That Christ, on that cross, was like a sponge. And every drop of God's eternal fury against sin was placed on Him. That is where the answer to this question is found. Another story that's presented in Scripture is the woman caught in adultery. Jesus forgives her. Even though, what did the law say had to happen? She must be stoned. Mark 2. Jesus forgives a man. What does the law say? If you sin, you're to be dead. You're to be killed. How could Jesus forgive these people who are on the cross? He told that man, that, that thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. That man deserved to go to hell. How can he do that? Because the wrath that they deserved was put on him. Notice what it says in verse 25 of Romans 3. It says, Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood. The blood of Jesus Christ saves sinners. Romans 5, 9. It says in verse 9 there, it says, Much more than having now been justified by His blood. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. How are we justified by the blood of Christ? Are we actually washed? Literally washed? Are we, so physically, are we washed in blood when we're saved? What does it mean when the Bible says that Christ's blood cleanses us? Well, again, we have to go back to the Old Testament. God said in the Old Testament that the life of the animal, and this applies to any living thing, this is just a simple fact of science, it says the life of the animal, the life of the creature is in its blood. It's a fact, it's a very deep scientific fact. You cannot survive without blood in your veins, without your heart pumping blood. That's a, that's a fact of science. God states that, though, to reveal to us a spiritual truth. 
And even aside from the spiritual truth, if you go to the doctor and they want to find out a lot about your health, you know what they're going to do? They're going to take blood. They're going to, do, they're going to run blood tests on you. I remember I, had a, I went to the doctor it's about two years ago, and uh, they, took, they took blood, and they ran a whole series of tests. It was just like two pages, all these things that they were telling me about my, my health, just through blood. It's amazing. It's really astounding. And I was pretty good, uh, they said. Glucose was a little low. It means I get to eat extra sugar. But nonetheless... They were able to discern a lot about my health through just my blood. And God says, in the spiritual sense, the life of the creature is in his blood. In that, we can't survive about blood. And so when, when these animals were killed in the Old Testament, and God even told them to slit the neck, let the blood spill out, what was that for? And even when they take the Blood, and they would sprinkle it on the different instruments that were used in the temple and used in the tent of meeting. And even on the on Yom Kippur, on the day of atonement, when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, as I spoke on last week, and he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat on the top of the Ark of the Covenant. What's that for? The blood symbolizes life. And so when the blood is leaving the animal, the life is being ripped out. And the life is being taken. Life for life. Tooth for tooth. Arm for arm. Hand for hand. Punch for punch. It is God being just. But the animals can't take away sin. We know that. No animal can take away sin. It was all pointing to Christ. Who went upon that cross. And even before that cross, as He's beaten, as He's whipped, and as He's pierced, and as the blood is spilling forth, it is showing that his life is being demanded of him instead of us. See, we're debtors to God. We're in debt to him for many things. But when someone is outside of Christ, they owe God their life. They owe God eternity in hell. They owe him that. See, it's the wages of sin. His death. We've earned it. We've earned this debt from our sin. And therefore, they deserve eternity in hell. They deserve God's wrath. They deserve to be killed and crushed eternally. Turned into dust. And blown in the wind. And lost forever. In the place of our darkness. But Christ comes in and spills His own blood. That is what it means when the Bible says we are saved by the blood of Christ. That blood symbolized his life. And then it says this in verse 25. This was to demonstrate, in other words, to put on display so all the world could see. And that's what it says in, the, in, in verse 25 at the beginning. It says he displayed him as a public propitiation. It wasn't hidden. It wasn't in a corner. This was open so everyone could see. It says this was to demonstrate his righteousness. God possesses intrinsic perfection. Inherent, built-in perfection. And so the cross is not only a display of God's love and God's mercy, but a display of God's wrath and God's holiness. And then look what it says. Because in the forbearance of God, He passed over the sins previously committed. This is talking about the Old Testament. Moses, Abraham, Rahab, a harlot, the wicked Israelites, David, Samuel. Ruth. Abigail. Men and women of God were forgiven and there was no propitiation. Because we know the lambs, the animals could not take away sin. So there was no forgiveness. There was actually, in the sense of, there was no propitiation. There was no actual Sin bearer in their day. But what does the text say?
say here in God's forbearance? What does forbearance mean? It means you know what's coming. You, you're, you're bearing something in anticipation for something else. Parents forbear all the time with their children. They have young toddlers misbehaving. They're forbearing. They are dealing with their children in forbearance because knowing one day they're going to be mature enough not to be crazy and misbehave. Those of your parents, you know what I'm talking about. Remember when your kids were young? You dealt with them in forbearance. You knew one day they were going to be mature enough to act right. So you dealt with them in forbearance. Dealt with them graciously. And God dealt with the people of the Old Testament times in forbearance, knowing that a Savior was coming to pay for their sin. God was not sweeping their sin in the rug. And God was not just arbitrarily forgetting about it. What does the psalmist say? As far as the east is from the west, so he's removed our iniquities from us. He even talks about how he, he tosses them in the sea. Tosses them in the sea. Let us not ever think, and let us surely never think this about God, that he forgave those things and just let it go and forgot about his own holiness. We need to remember something. God is from God. God is for God. God is for Himself. God is for His own glory. As we just talked about this morning in our Sunday school, God works everything for His glory. And so when it comes to salvation, God will never negate His holiness. And so all those hundreds of years, thousands of years, pass by. Moses goes to heaven. Abraham goes to heaven. Rahab goes to heaven. They're saved. And they're just, time is going by. There's no propitiation, no payment. And then Christ comes in and pays for sin. What is Satan? He is the accuser of the brethren. The Bible talks about how he accuses us before God day and night. So just imagine, imagine this. Just imagine, take your mind back to those ancient days, right when God forgave Abraham. I right would Abraham was saying, just imagine that. As Abraham is walking with God, let your mind go and think about what it would have been like in heaven. Satan standing there before God. God, what are you doing? You're holy. You're just God. You can't forgive him. What are you doing? What are you doing? He's a sinner. You can't forgive him. On down the line, David comes along, forgives David, saves David. Satan comes before God. God, you can't forgive him. He's a sinful man. He is a sinner in your eyes. And you know it. You ought to destroy him in your wrath. You cannot forgive him. You're a holy God. And there is more accusations that are lifted up before God. And one day comes Christ. And the accusations of Satan are put to silence. And it's done. He cries on the cross to tell us die. It is finished. The sins of God's people are paid for in full. It's gone. God's wrath is absolutely gone. And so God can now say back, I am both the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in my Son. That's what it says in verse 26. He says again, for the demonstration I say of his righteousness at the present time. He says the same thing again. He wants us to get this. Paul's wanting us to get this. God is displaying his righteousness so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That is the glory of the gospel. This is what we die for. This is what we're, if, if, if it comes to it, if persecution comes to it, this is what we're going to die for. If we are persecuted to the point of death in our lives as believers, this is what we're going to die for. This is what we live for. This is what we pray for. This is what we seek for. This is the, 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 the heart of all piety in the Christian life. All holiness comes from this. Realizing what God has done for us in Christ. Just and the justifier. This is the wisdom of God. This is the glory of God. The gospel is the gospel of God's glory. No other religion has anything resembling this. Absolutely nothing. Not even close. 
other religions, for example, Islam, they say they say their God is holy, they say their God is just, but then they also say their God forgives. And there's never a resolving of that. There is never a relieving of that tension, and there's a total contradiction. Because you can't be holy and forgive sinners. But God provided the way through His Son so that He could do something which really in the, in the human mind is impossible to do. He did. It is as if, going back to the analogy I gave earlier, a judge here in South Carolina, as a filthy murderer and adulterer, a rapist stands before them and is condemned, and they're put on death row, awaiting their sentence. And we all applaud that. We all say, that is just. They have done something that is worthy of death. But someone comes in and pays the bail, pays the fine, propitiates the law. They can be freed and they can walk away from death row. That is the heart of the gospel. That's what God has done. Christ has saved us from death row. He has satisfied God's wrath against sin and the sinner. You may have said, Lucas, I've heard you say this so many times. Not only this sermon, but your other sermons. I want us to get this. I don't care about anything else you remember. If I die tomorrow, and it's the last sermon you hear, I want you to know this. This is the heart of it. This is what it's all about. If you die tomorrow, this is what I want you to hear, I want you to know. I want to drill on this point, because there's so little drilling on this point. How many of you have been in church for many years? How often do you hear this preach? How often do you hear this talk about? This ought to be brought to your attention every sermon. It ought to every time a man of God steps into a pulpit, this ought to be brought to your attention. It may not be the center focal point of the sermon, but at least in closing or at the beginning or in midway, somewhere, bring it back to the cross. Bring it back to Christ. It's not worth me giving you a listen if you're not going to bring it back to the cross. It's not worth my time listening to preaching. That is not Christ in it. What else matters but the gospel? What else matters but this? John Calvin said, apart from the gospel, everything is useless and vain. Everything. Just doesn't matter. So that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Brethren, not only is Christ our justifier, but the Father Himself, the judge, is the justifier. The one who, apart from the gospel and apart from Christ, we are to fear because we deserve His damning wrath. Yet, in the gospel, in the context of salvation, He becomes the one who saves us. He becomes the one who justifies us. Going back to the analogy, you could put it this way. Going back to the man's on death row, the murderer, the adulterer, the, 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 the rapist is sitting on death row, and the man who comes and pays his fine is not just some random guy, but the judge's son. The judge himself calls up his own son and says, Son, sell your house, sell everything you have, sell yourself into slavery, give up everything, and pour yourself out for this man. Get him off the death row. And the stranger is forgiven by the judge, and he's let free. That's the glory of the gospel. God Himself is doing it. It's not like God is over here hating us and then Jesus comes in loving us. If you see it that way, brethren, oh, my heart breaks for you. Don't see it that way. It's not that. God is the one. Why did Christ die for us? To make God love us? No. Because God loved us. That's so important. Jesus did not die to make or convince God to love us. Like, oh, right, God, if I just do this, I'll make you happy enough to love the people. No. What does is, what is Ephesians 1 tell us? In love, He predestined us. Before we were born, before this world was created, God says love on us. Jesus came to die because God loved us. Not so that God would love us. Jesus came to display God's love, which He had set on us in eternity past.
That is how God can be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Brethren, rest in this. I want you to know that. I want you to master this. I want you to run this through your mind day after day after day. I want you to know this backwards and forwards. Preach to yourself. Share the gospel with yourself. Know it. Master it. Make it your own. Grab hold of it. This is the pearl of great price. This is the healing balm of Gilead. Whatever you're going through in your life, I tell you what, you look to the gospel, and you look to the glory of God as is revealed in the gospel, your heart will be filled with joy. If you're regenerate and you're saved, your heart will be filled with joy. There is a, there is some, it's just so glorious. Where do we go to find rest? Where do we go? After a long day of work, we go to turn on the TV. Sometimes we do. We talk with our spouse. Sometimes we do. Pursue a hobby. Sometimes we do. Do yard work, clear our minds. Sometimes we do. But where is the place of ultimate rest? Where is the place that we can just fall on our faces? in reverential praise before God. It is in the gospel. As we see God's holiness. See, this establishes God's holiness. This shows us how glorious He is, but it establishes His grace as well. And so we can say in agreement with the hymn writer, the love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. How true that is. Or we could say with the hymn we just sang earlier, Let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem, and crown him Lord of all. He's worthy because of what he's done for us. And if you're unconverted, you're lost, you need to believe, you need to repent, and believe this. Flee your sin, or else be damned. Don't be, don't die in your sins. But believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved from your sin. You'll be saved to be born from above. Repent and believe this. In the one who is both the just and justifier, and the one who has faith in Jesus. And that's what we've seen here. In, clo in closing and in conclusion, that's what we've seen at the limo. God can be holy and gracious. God can be righteous and loving. God can be wrathful and merciful because of the gospel. Because of propitiation. Because Christ absorbed His wrath. He is just and He is the justifier the one who has faith in Jesus. And as I said earlier, in the economy of salvation, this is all to bring God glory. All to the glory of God. God has done this so that He gets praise. And so let us pray Praise His name forever. And give Him glory with our lives, with our thoughts, with our speech, with everything. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. To God, the God of glory, the holy and merciful God, the just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus, to Him be the glory ever. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we as your children love you, Lord. We, we adore you and we, we want to be more like you, Lord God. Make us more like you, oh God. Conform us to the image of Christ. I pray, Father, that the gospel would, would permeate our lives would be upon our hearts and minds daily. I pray for anyone who has heard this or is going to hear this, who is unconverted, 
That you would bring them to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> cause them to be born again. Oh God, please do this. We thank you, oh God. We thank you for your mercy. For the cross of Jesus Christ. Nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross of Christ do I cling. What else do I have before you but Christ? What else is my boast but Christ? He is our all in all, Lord. Oh, how we thank you that that great dilemma is revealed. The dilemma. How can you be holy and forgive the sinner? Oh God, now we can all say, Christ, Christ. Christ, He is the gospel. Oh, Jesus, we praise You. Be glorified in us. And in the preaching of Your gospel. And Lord, as You work out every event in this world, we ask that You would do it for our good and for Your glory. To You be glory forever.